I recognize that really all this practice, spiritual practice, is really for one reason only. It's to become a complete human being and, what, and to really understand what that means, you know. And uh, sound meditation and mantra chanting and kirtan, these are tools that we have to help us rediscover our true nature, or who we really are. Hey there, this is Jim Donovan. Welcome to the show. I am so glad you're here. Today we have a very special show. Our guest is my friend Krishna Das, or KD as his friends call him. He is a Grammy-nominated recording artist, a world-renowned spiritual teacher, and a master of a beautiful style of chanting called Kirtan. He's written several books about chanting and released an award-winning documentary about his work and his life. Uh, first of all, KD, welcome to the show. I I've really been looking forward to this. Uh, I started this podcast just a few months ago, and you were one of the first people I thought of, but I wanted to get some practice before uh, before I talk <laughs> to you. Now, I was just looking through all of your stuff. You know, I've, I've known you for years. We've uh, we come into contact every so often, and I was reading, is it true that you nearly ended up as the lead singer of Blue Oyster Cult? Well, ended up is certainly the right phrase. If that had happened, I would have been long gone. What it was, it was really simple. It wasn't, you know, so I was at, in college out at Stony Brook on Long Island, New York State University, and a friend of mine met some, I think they were local local kids. They might have even still been in high school at the time. And... Uh, he, they were looking to start a little band, so my friend knew that I was a singer. So we all got together and played some music together for a while. And then I kind of lost track of them because they were kind of getting into dope and I was getting out of dope. So yeah, uh, it wasn't really working. So then a few years later, my life had changed quite a bit and I was uh, living upstate New York. I had met, once again, Ram Dass that year. Mm -hmm. I was going to spend time with him in uh where he was up in uh new hampshire so i moved out of my cabin in the woods and uh i drove down to back to stony brook for Jimi hendrix concert <laughs> wow and uh after the concert all we were all hanging out and uh sandy perlman who later brought the clash over and he, so he was producing that band which when they were now calling themselves mm -hmm. the soft white underbelly okay and uh he said the guy who had replaced me in the studio couldn't sing, couldn't couldn't do it. Wow. So would he? Would I come back and cut the vocal tracks? They had a record recorded, <laughs> and they were about to go out on tour, first tour. So uh, you know, this was my dream, really. And um, but I had run into another dream, which was I had come into contact with Ram Das, who was an American who. Uh, had just come back from India. Yeah. And while he was in India, he met a guru there and his whole life changed. And he came back uh, to America and I had just met him and my whole life began to change. So there was no doubt in my mind that's where I was going. And even though I would have liked to have done that, it wasn't even a possibility because I had fallen in love with this other way of living in a sense. And, uh, my old dreams had lost a lot of power over me, so to speak. What was it about Ram Das? Like, was he teaching you things? Was he saying things? Was it just charisma? What flicked that switch for you? Well, it was all that. He was really talking about his experience with his guru, who became my guru as well. Yep. His name was Neem Karoli Baba. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just so lit up, you know, that... Almost everyone who met him just went like, whoa, wow, this is really, this is something. He was transmitting. You know, the 60s had come and just about were going, you know. People had done a lot of drugs, a lot of acid. Mm -hmm. They wanted to change the world, but they didn't realize they had to change themselves first. Or rather that there's really no difference ultimately between yourself and the world. So yeah. if you want to change the world, you must work on yourself. But there was no understanding of what that was. 
So Ramdas really brought that new way of seeing life and living in the world in a good way. He brought that back from India with him. But when he spoke about it, he spoke about it in a totally Western, understandable way, you know, for us who hadn't been there or really didn't know much about it. Yeah, because at the time, that's that's a pretty mysterious place for Westerners. There's not a lot of common knowledge. Yeah, and it was far away. It was far away, you know. Yeah, now you get on a plane, you're there in like 13 hours, and and you have cell phones and, and GPS, and you, you know, everything is, it's, it's just like you're going to go down the road. In those days, it was far away. When Ram Dass would speak with people, were they workshops or just with a friend group? What did it look like? Yeah, no, people knew about him because of his association with Tim Leary and being kicked out of Harvard. Okay. Richard Alpert was his name. Yeah. And the people who had done a lot of acid in the early 60s knew about him. Yeah. And so when he came back with this kind of, I don't want to sound weird, but like a new message and a deeper understanding of things, uh, he, people just flocked to him. And he just spoke hundreds and hundreds of people at a time, with workshops, lectures, all everything, you know. Do you think it's because people have this inherent knowledge that there is something deeper, but that our typical life that has been happening and was happening wasn't really addressing the depth of the possibility? Well, absolutely. But I would just simply say everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants the same thing, but nobody knows how to get it. Everybody wants, everybody's hungry, but no matter how much they eat, no matter how much pleasure they get, no matter how much pain they avoid, they don't find real love, real happiness. Yeah. And that's not available in Western culture because Western culture is based on the conceptual mind, the intellect, and the emotions. And as long as we're identified with those ever-shifting, always-changing ways of seeing the world and being in the world, we can never find real, real happiness, real love. Like a dog chasing its tail, maybe. Very much, very much. Or eating a bone and, and without the meat. Shri Guru Charna Saroja Raja Jamano Makuru Sudhar what role does chanting play in this? This is something you've dedicated your whole life to. Well, I don't know if I would say it that way. I think it pretty much ate me up alive. <laughs> well, yeah. chanting is a, is a meditation practice. It's based on the, uh, the, the understanding that these sounds that we chant come from a place that's deeper than our thoughts and our emotions deeper than what we call the mind. Of course, the mind is a very complex, is defined very many different ways by different traditions. But let's just say our thoughts, deeper than our thoughts, deeper than our emotions. And by the repetition of these sounds, everything calms down. You calm down, you slow down, you begin to uh, experience different types of feelings from within that don't come from the usual uh, business that we do in the world of relationships and getting things and getting rid of things and stuff like that. So the thing is that in India, they call these sounds, they call these sounds the names of God. They don't think God is something outside there, up in the sky with a big white beard throwing thunderbolts at us because we're bad little boys and girls, you know. <laughs> and they understand that the divine lives within us as our own true nature. And these sounds lead us back into ourself and, and turn us towards our inner, a deeper place inside of us. So beautifully put. So a lot of our listeners will be new to you. This will be the first time they've ever heard your name uh, and heard of, the I, word, had heard of the word kirtan. I pity them. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're so hard on yourself. You've always been hard on yourself. <laughs> um, it's because I know me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you do a, it's a devotional style of chant called kirtan. Yeah. How, how, how would you explain kirtan to someone who's never encountered it before? It's just chanting. It's call and response chanting. You know, every spiritual tradition has some kind of chanting involved. Yeah. And uh, in India, they do this everywhere. Uh, it's a main, the main practice in India is chanting, whether they're chanting 
longer mantras or they're chanting these sounds. Uh, they don't, for the most part, most people don't meditate. Most people don't do hatha yoga. Most people uh, live in the world. They're very busy. But every day they do some puja or, or some prayers. And those prayers are actually mantras for the most part. So this practice is based on the repetition of these sounds. Usually the way I do it was the way I kind of learned it or was exposed to it, that there's a leader and then there's a response by the, a group or another person or a number of people. And the leader just you know, goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The leader might change the melody, might speed it up, this and that, and the chorus responds. And it's a group practice. But at the same time, it's not really about the group. It's about your own experience inside of that. Uh, it's not about music. It doesn't matter if you can sing or not sing. Uh, it's about learning how to pay attention to what's actually going on around you and within you. So it's very simple practice. You don't need to be initiated in it or anything like that. You just sing and then go home and be stupid. You know, it's just nothing. It doesn't, <laughs> whatever changes, changes. You don't have to hold on to anything. You don't have to join anything you know the older i get and i certainly am i recognize that really all this practice spiritual practice is really for one reason only it's to become a complete human being and what and to really understand what that means you know and uh sound meditation and mantra chanting and kirtan these are tools that we have to help us rediscover our true nature who we really are and that would make sense. I, I remember coming to New York and doing some performing with you. And I remember you telling me about, uh, I was staying at your house and you said, hey, don't don't be alarmed. At four in the morning, I get up and I do chanting. I no, I go to the bathroom. I don't know what year that was. <laughs> four in the morning is maybe the second or third time I get up to take a piss. <laughs> well... Then or I don't remember anything. I, you, are you sure I said that? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. remember I, ever getting up at four. I remember going to sleep at four. <laughs> <laughs> you said you had this practice that you that you would do daily. Uh, really? maybe, maybe it was the Hanuman Chalisa or some, some something like that. Uh, or maybe I'm just remembering terribly. I, it, that happens too. I, I, maybe you're at somebody else's house. I have no idea. <laughs> But you you have a daily a daily practice. I do have daily practice. Okay, yes. that that whole idea of becoming more yourself. Yeah, I mean, is is that the whole reason to to do the daily practice? Is there are there other things? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's really we are creatures of habit, habits of behavior, habits of thought, habits of action, and we believe lots of things about ourselves that are uh, essentially not true, and we've been programmed to believe those things by our lives, by our parents, by our schools, by our culture, by our interactions and our experiences. And the result of those misbeliefs are, is suffering, is our pain and unhappiness. So all these practices are really deprogramming us from what we've been led to believe about ourselves and about life. And it uncovers the, the practices are for just for the sake of uncovering the love, the beauty within us that's already there. We don't have to get it from anywhere. We can't. These practices are about uncovering what's already within us and allowing us to find what we're really looking for in life. Almost like a, a sonic archaeological dig, like mo moving, yeah. moving the dirt, moving all the stuff. And where, yeah. Where's the essence? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have a recollection a memory about the first time you encountered Kirtan? Well, I probably heard some chanting while I was still in America, but it didn't, whatever it is, it didn't do much for me. I don't remember. But when I first got to India and went up to the mountains, I was uh, walking around this lake in the town where I was living in. I walked by an ancient temple that was there on the side of the lake, and I heard this extraordinary rocking chanting coming out of there. I just could not believe it. I mean, they were wailing, and I just, like, I'd never heard anything like this. I just stopped, and I just was, like, transfixed, you know. I could not move. And then some guy was walking into the temple, and he saw me, and he grabbed my arm, and he pulled me into the temple with him, and I just sat there, and wow. it was rocking. It was so joyful. I said, this is it for me. <laughs> this is, 
I want this. This is I. This is it. It was all the lights went on. This and that was yeah. From that moment on, anywhere I heard chanting, I went and I just sat. I just tried to absorb it. You know, I wasn't collecting because you know I wasn't in my mind when I left America to go to India in August 1970. I was never going to come back. I, I had no plan. I gave everything away. I had not. I was going with. I had this tiny little backpack and uh, a couple of hundred dollars, and that was it. And I, I, I was never coming back. Wow. So I wasn't collecting for the future. I was <laughs> finally getting a mainlining right there. It was happening for me right there, and that was amazing for me. It's interesting because that's exactly what you did for me at, uh-huh. G- at Jiva Mukti first night we met. Uh-huh. And I came in and you you allowed me to sit in with you. Like day one, you let me come in and sit in on this this thing called a kirtan. Somebody <laughs> gave me a, a lyric sheet with all these hin- Hindi words on them that yeah. what, I, I really had no context or idea what was going to happen. I just thought I would follow along and try to try to hold on. <laughs> and, and the energy that you're describing, your experience it was exactly what I felt. And I felt that call and response between you and the people and back and forth. And it wasn't a performance. It was, you know, your eyes were closed. Everybody's eyes were closed. Everybody participated. There was clapping. There were, you know, tabla drums, uh, bells. And there was just this constant repetition over and over and over. You know, it would start in this really soft place and reach this ecstatic place that was, I have never experienced in all my life even though I, I played in a band and we did things sort of like that yeah you showed me this this other bar mm. that i have since been attempting to recreate every time i work with people or every mm-hmm. time i i perform like that mm-hmm. that selfless selfless ecstasy where it's mm-hmm. not about me it's not about even the music it's about Let's go there together. Let's be in that place together. And right. whether you like it or not, you're responsible. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for it because it's it's become the thing. As as I go through my life, I realize that I want to focus the most on is bringing you know the the power of the voice into people's lives so that they feel like they can use it as a daily tool something they can they can lean into mm-hmm. um as a way i mean even just to do health related things like lift their depression and de-stress mm-hmm. you know, feel, con- sure. feel connected with each other but that's yeah. you know, i just wanted to make sure that you knew that it was that that particular night it it hit me like a mac truck that's beautiful yeah, yeah. what were you doing there in the first place how did you yeah, well, um, our, our our mutual friend, who you call Raghu, Mitch, Mitchell Marcus. Oh, yeah, that's right. We, that's right. we were on Triloka Records together for, for a couple of years, and he uh-huh. said, you need to go meet this guy because uh-huh. you guys can do some things together, right. and and, that, and that's what I was there to do. I was here, here to meet this guy, whoever this person is, <laughs> and, and I'm excited. I don't even know what I expected. I didn't see a picture of you. I'm thinking you're, you're going to have like a big, long white robe on. Maybe you're going to have a, a beard and some sort of little beanie hat. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Maybe a staff, you know, golden staff, and okay, to hit people with. And it was really disappointing just to see. <laughs> um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still disappointed. Every time. <laughs> But you brought up an interesting thing, yes, you know, everything you want to do, we want to do, or we want to happen for people. In the East, they call this mind training. It's not, they they turn it back on itself, it's mind training. So if one wants to get a different perspective on what their feelings, maybe depression, maybe all kinds of things, anxiety, fear, what's required? So yes, there is some practice required. But the key to all the practice is paying attention. And that means 
you're singing, you're playing, you're doing whatever you're doing, some musically or with sound. But you need to pay attention so that when you notice that your mind has wandered and for the last 20 minutes, even though you, there's noise coming out of your mouth, your mind's been somewhere else, you need to bring it back yeah. again and again. That is the secret key to transforming ourselves. We don't want to be only concerned with the external world, that with the outer sound, the sound that we're making by banging on things or with our vocal cords. We want to add attention to that. Yeah. Because that's the strength that we we develop from by keep coming back to the sound or the, the music or whatever it is, bringing ourselves back again and again and again. That's where you get the inner strength that transforms one's life. And that's the discipline and it's the repetition of bringing oneself back. Yeah. That's what you're saying. It's that, that repetition, it's almost like building a skill set. It gives you something <laughs> back to. Otherwise, all you have is random sense awarenesses, sense input all day long, all lifelong. You, you, you're not making any choices there. Right. You, may, you might make a choice to watch a movie, but basically you're at the mercy of all this input that your subjectivity, your emotions and your bullshit is interpreting in a certain kind of way, which then you look at and you don't like. In other words, because we see ourselves out there, our own subjective reality is what we're projecting on the outside world. And so that's why it's so important to come back to that one thing, yeah. that sound again and again, because that's the way you take the energy away from those projections, which are self-fulfilling prophecies that usually bring us uh, frustration and unhappiness. And we it trains us to let go of that and allow what's within us, which is all good. Talking deeper than the mind and emotions, where our true nature is all good. And there's no doubt about that. No matter what we feel about ourselves, that's just ego stuff. That's, that's personality stuff. There's something underneath that, which we can tap into through these practices. Is it like that the sound, the mantra, is, is the lighthouse? And our attention is like being out, out in the ocean, maybe not focused in the right direction. And then the lighthouse kind of goes, oh, here, here it is. Come back to this. Come back to this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's very, mu very much that. That's a beautiful image. Yeah. We are out on the ocean and we're being battered by the waves and blown around. Yeah. The, the motor's gone. We have no sense of direction. We don't know which way the harbor is, you know. And uh, the desire to find the harbor is something that a lot of people don't even believe in. They don't have that understanding that there is a harbor. There is safe water. There is land somewhere. And uh, that desire to find land comes from the recognizing that we're never going to get what we want from stuff. From stuff, no matter how much stuff we have, you always want more. Or you, then you have to protect it. And then you have to move it over here. And then you have to do this with it. There's no end to stuff. And there's no joy. There's no truth in stuff either. There's no reality to it. Yeah. No, thank you. Don't cry, Jim. Ah, oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, all, it's all I do. I'm a Pisces. When I met you in New York City, this, this yoga studio maybe held 40 people, from what I remember, 40 or 50 people. And this is late 90s. In between now and then, uh, you've begun to travel the world, you go to Europe, you go to India, you're all over the States. Some, some of the venues you play in are, are actual music halls, music mm -hmm. the theaters. Yeah. What, what do you think it is about what you are offering people that is making that audience grow? Your audience has gone you know, from zero to you know, many millions of people. Yeah, I think really the main thing that's transmitted is, you know, what I'm doing really is just sharing my practice. I'm not really trying to do anything for anybody. I'm not trying to get anybody off or give them any particular type of experience. I'm sharing what I do to save my own ass. And people can then pick up on it and save their own asses. And if I was trying to entertain or get people off, it would be a completely different vibe. Right. You know, and even though it might be fun, there wouldn't be any, any, any deeper gift given in those moments or taken in those moments. So um, I think it's just like we said before, everybody wants to be happy and when they, and wants 
to find real love that doesn't come, doesn't go, you know, which is our own true nature. So that's where these chants come from. So when people hear them, if they have that longing, they respond. You know, not everybody, including me, not really understands what's going on here. But we, I have that longing that knows that this is, is the direction that the lighthouse is in because I can see the light yeah. in the distance, you know, which is, reminds me of a terrible story, fortunately. You know, I was watching this great um, documentary, yeah. Ken, Ken Burns and Country Music. It was, okay. Have you seen that? No. Oh, my God. It is so great. Yeah, country, it's like about eight or ten, two-hour it's like a it's extraordinary anyway hank williams who's one of my favorites mm. you know He's great. All, you know he wrote that song i see the light uh lying in the back of a, of a of a car he couldn't sit up in the cars anymore because he had terrible back pain so he wrote that song because he saw the light of the the town in the distance but when he was dying his wife i think it was at the time either played that song for him or something like that. And he just said to her, there is no light. <laughs> there is no light. And, you know, for most people, there really is no light. Even though we're in it, surrounded by it all the time, and it's actually already within us, most people don't really see the possibility of overcoming the programming that's taught us that we're no fucking good, that we'll never get what we want, no matter how much we grab it and hold on to it. Yeah. You know, to overcome that, that kind of programming, most people are so lost in that, that there's no light. Uh, that was a very touching moment when he, for me, very powerful. Yeah. Much pathos, you know. He wrote the song, but he didn't believe, really, that there was any light. Wow. So. Why do you think that we as human beings, get to go through that constant search for ourselves? Well, first of all, not everybody goes through that. Very few people, percentage-wise in this world, are actually feeling that longing to see through the, the illusions and, and the delusions and, and all the things that cause us suffering. Most people are just, you know, they, they get born, they graduate high school, they drink some beer and they die. And they're not here for a moment. Yeah. They, don't, they don't ever question, what is this? So I think it's very much a karmic thing. In other words, I think everybody has different stuff to work through. And if one is ripe enough, one will uh, feel that longing to find out what this is. And how do we find out who we are within this big mess of nonsense going on? You, either you're, you have that calling or you don't, or you're not aware that you... But it doesn't mean anybody's better than anybody else. We're all the same very much, very much the same. I can see that. When you record music, when you, when you chant, when you travel, what do you hope for people when they show up and encounter this, the kirtan? <laughs> I don't hope for people. I, I, it's not like that. That wouldn't be fair, you know? All I do is I, I try to do my best in the, in the situation, whatever it is, that's all I can. That's the only thing I can even have the possibility of uh, impacting is how I do what I do and how I give it the best shot. You know, so if I had hopes for people, you know, uh, then that they would feel that that would constrict them. Uh, then they would I would be singing with a motive, and my motive would be even might be their own their happiness. So maybe they would unconsciously feel that manipulation i'm trying to manipulate them to be happy or to get off or to enjoy the concert or enjoy the, the chanting and then they would they might fake it but inside they could not open because of the manipulation a flower opens when the sun comes out the sun is unconcerned whether that flower opens or not it's the flower's nature and the nature of the sun so when love is there we open when love is not there we don't open you can't manipulate love. You can't coerce a heart to open. So I have enough trouble keeping myself turned to the goddamn lighthouse, you know? That's my <laughs> job. What other people do is their problem, you know? But I'm just trying to do what I do the best I can.
which in a strange way is probably why your audience keeps swelling because what you are describing, at least in my experience, is rare, that someone would put themselves in front of people, share the practice that they do for themselves, and that's the full expectation. Yeah. is what Here's what we're doing, and like you said, you'll respond the way you respond, the way that you need to. It's not my job to decide for you what it is. Very much, yeah. That's my work, to keep remembering that. Yeah. Over and over again, you know, to keep coming back to the deepest motivation. And I think work is the right word because we are surrounded by the opposite. Yeah. The opposite message. We have to do this for that. And we have to plan it this way so that this thing happens and we have to have the goal so that we get to that point eventually yeah. someday. Yeah. And this is what you're describing in describing it is more simple. Like it is the simplest and and yet the hardest. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, the the other way to sing is to try to get in touch with that inner longing that we have and not be discouraged by what's what's happening in the outside world, but really just plug into that deep, that longing that we have to, to become full, complete human beings, to really get what we need in life uh, and get what we want. And um, that will lead us on into the right place. Uh, it might lead us a whole lot of places first, but then eventually we learn as we go. That's such good advice. I, uh, I'm going to keep replaying this and remembering it. I better replay it too because I forgot what I said. <laughs> it's on record now, man. We got it. Good. Hey, when uh, a, a while back, I can't remember what year this was. And maybe you've done it multiple times, so I apologize for not knowing. Um, this practice that you do, kirtan, originated in India, as, as far as I understand. I think so, yeah. Uh, when you, you actually did a tour of India, mm -hmm. did you have any worries about, as, a, as an American coming to India, to offer something that is, quote-unquote, theirs? You know, I had this dream many years ago, after I'd been in India, you know, somewhere maybe in the 80s. I dreamt that I was coming back to Earth, reincarnating, you know into a new body. And I was heading right home to India. Everything was cool. But for some reason, at the last minute, I made a left turn and wound up in New York. <laughs> and what happened? What, what is that? You know? So it's actually the other way. I'm, I'm more Indian in a way than I am American, as I see myself. Yeah. And the whole thing in India, the whole, and all so-called spiritual practices is what they call bhavana or bhav. It's like an emotional intensity that's driven by the longing to connect or to really do something completely, to immerse oneself in something. And that's the key to spiritual practice. And this is what they worship in India more than anything is this bhavana. This, If you have that, they feel it and they respect it. And they seem to think I have it. So, you know, this group, these people organized the kirtan for me in Mumbai. So I went over there and I never, I just wasn't really interested, you know, how many people are coming, where is it? So they take me to the hall and it's a big hall, but still it didn't, I didn't think about it. And when I finally came out on stage later, there were 2,000 people. Oh my gosh. And they all stood up and applauded and I just stopped. And I said, what are you people doing here? Go home. Go away. Go, go. What is it? India is full of kirtan wallas of champions. Go, get out. Go. And they all laughed. Ah. And it was mind-blowing. They knew every word of every chant because, of course, the chants are more or less traditional. But the melodies are from Long Island, where I grew up. But, but the weird thing was that as soon as I started to take it, tell a joke, they were already laughing. They knew it all from YouTube. <laughs> Everything. They knew what they were getting into, and they still came, you know? Wow. So that was amazing. It was, it was wonderful to be appreciated that way and to be recognized that way for sure. Because I really, for me, it all came from India. That, you know, until I connected with India, uh, my life was all black and white. But once I connected with India, it was technicolor. It was all, 
all the colors of the rainbow. And so I owe everything to India in that respect. And I really wasn't sure whether I should go and sing there. And I said to my teacher, uh, Sidney Ma was my, took care of us after Maharaji left the body, after my guru died. She was his great disciple and she took care of all of us. And I said, Ma, you know, she was always telling me to rest, take it easy, you know. <laughs> Don't travel so much, stay yeah. home. So I said, I figured, so I figured she'd just say, forget it, you know. So I said, Ma, you know, I'm getting all these emails from Indian people asking me to come sing here. Should I accept? And I really, I thought she was just going to say, you know, no, I just leave India to the Indians. You stay home and rest. I said, Ma, she said, you must. Oh, wow. Like that. So no hesitate. You must. I went, oh, shit, I shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to go and sing as long as the body hangs, can hang out, you know, and maintain some ability to move around. Basically, my, I really see my job in life is to sing wherever I'm invited to sing, if it's at all possible. Yeah, That's what I try to do. I think that's a great job. You do it very well. Thank you. Is it accurate to say that one of the main reasons you went to India was Ram Das? I met Ram Das after he came back from his first trip, and that was uh, life-changing for me. And I traveled around with him in the States for about a year and a half. Then I decided, well, it's coming through him. It's not him. It's coming through him. Yeah. It's his guru that I'm feeling. So I wanted to go meet the guru, yeah. So that's why I went there. His book, Be Here Now, traveled with us, uh, Rusted Root, on our tour bus for yeah. years. Like it was just, it was on the table and we'd pick it up and look at it, hang out with it, draw some of the pictures that were in it. And you know, little did I know that, that those ideas would seep into my consciousness and they would affect me today in 2020. It's, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I know the two of you uh, were very good friends for a long time. What can you tell our listeners about him you know, what did he bring to the world? If there's a way to sum that up, I don't know. He was brilliant. He was a psychologist. He was well-trained in all that stuff. What he really brought to the world was a goodness of heart, a goodness of heart that included everybody. You know, Maharaji used to tell us, love everyone, serve everyone, feed everyone. The best form to worship God is all forms. And Ram Dass, over the years of his ripening, of his soul, so to speak. He really, towards the very end of his life, he really had merged deeply into that place of caring and loving of, of everyone and anyone who came to him. And he had really transcended uh, the separate personality, the, the separate self, small s self, the ego, yeah. and really had entered into the deep oneness of love. So he was... Uh, a pioneer for the West. He, he absorbed the Eastern culture and he translated and transmitted it to, to Westerners in, in a way that they could understand. Yeah. Very, very great being. Such an important function, these generations that have come since then. Prior to him, I, I don't know of any other person that was really bringing that information, and this is the key, in a way that people could actually understand. I, I noticed that you do that a lot too. When you're describing things during your events, you put it in plain language. There's not all this esoteric language attached to what you teach. If you can't explain it, that means you don't really know it. And there's no pretending, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. If it if it hasn't become real for us, then it's it's a, a disservice to be talking about it. That's the way I feel about it. That makes From sense. Myself, you know. I, I only I try to say the things that I know and whatever that that might be. And if I don't know, I always say, well, they say. <laughs> yeah. They say this, they say that. I don't know who they are, but I know they say it. They say know? it for sure, yeah. Yeah. So it's like that. And um, yeah, like I said, Ram Dass really, he, he was able to express it in Western language that people understood naturally because he... There were Swamis who had come to America and, and continued to come, but they're Indian, and 
And while they may, their intentions may be good, there's a lot of subtle stuff that goes on. Yeah. Language and, you know. So Ramdas really was able to transcend those differences and really communicate the, the inner meaning of things. Were the two of you over in India together for a while? Yeah. I went in the, uh, August 70, and he came back uh, in the fall of 70, a couple of months later. He stayed a year, and then he returned home. Uh, I wound up staying until uh, March 72. Maharaji kept me there. He allowed me to stay. He actually got my, my visa extended so I could stay. Wow. Let's talk about him for a little while. So this man, his name was Neem Karoli Baba, and you talk about him so much in your work. And can you tell me about him? Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's so difficult to talk about him because anything you say is only like, you know, there's this um, allegorical story of the you know, six blind men asking to touch an elephant and describe the elephant. So one touches the tail and says, oh, the elephant is like a rope. The other touches the leg. Oh, the elephant is like a tree. And it touches his, you know, the elephant's like a, uh, you know, it's like that trying to describe somebody like Maharaji. Anything yeah. you say is only a small part. But he, he was like the sun who shined on everyone equally. You felt not only, not only did you love him because you basking in that sunlight, but you actually began to love yourself a little bit, which was a strange experience for us Westerners. Yeah. And because he saw us as souls, as as love ourselves, and he never judged us. He never wanted us to be this or that. He didn't. He loved us as we are, which is very unusual. There was no manipulation. There was no judgment. There was no hesitation. He was giving all the time, loving all the time, just like now every once in a while, you know, clouds get in front of the sun and those clouds, that was our stuff. Yeah. And then we get we we get depressed and upset and this and that, but then the sun firmly burns away those clouds and then ah, so this is how he taught. He didn't teach with words much. He didn't write books. He didn't lecture. Yeah. He just ripened us like like the fruit on a tree, you know. And uh, it was just different than anything I had felt ever before. Yeah. Oh, is was it like he saw you in a way that no one had seen you before? He saw us in ways that we didn't, we didn't even see ourselves, you know, of course. Yeah, he saw us. He had become one with the whole universe. Everything was God for him. He was God. Everything was God. Everybody was God. Yeah. It's not like there's some God up in the sky that you you bow down to and then he blesses you. You know, it's not like that. Westerners think like that because that's what we were programmed to think. But right. that's not like that in the East, let's put it that way. They understand that Buddha nature the soul, inner reality, your true nature is always there. And it's completely pure and pure love and pure happiness, pure joy, ecstasy, bliss, happiness, whenever you want to say it. But it's covered by our stuff. Even though he saw all that stuff very clearly, he didn't. He wasn't caught by it. He, he saw us as we are underneath all that. And being fed in that deep place like that would help us very much to start on the road to overcoming the, the ways we limit ourselves in life. When he saw you in that way? Sees. When he sees, thank you. Yeah, these beings, they don't die. You know, they, yeah. the bodies go away, but it's, it's a hard concept for us because we identify with the body. Yeah. And we, we pretty much believe that when the body dies, we're finished. But that's not the way they think about it in the East, you might say. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Did it create any kind of dissonance in your mind that there's someone that sees more of you than you ever considered before? And how how did you, de <laughs> if, if it did create a dissonance or a struggle, was there anything that you did to grow into that? If it was only the fact that he saw everything about us and knew the past, the present, and the future, that might have created some fear or some anxiety. But this all happened inside of this vast presence, vast love. It was all within this love that we were allowed to come into that feeling. So it was amazement, but no, f not really fear. Yeah. But it took a little letting go. But he, he created 
situations happened where you recognized that all you had to do was let go to get back into the room of love. And so you just craved more letting go. And then you saw how hard it is to let go. So then you start to do some spiritual practice because you understand this is, you're training yourself to let go with these practices and get back and re-experience your own beauty and re-experience how it feels to be in that room of love. Yeah. He is considered a saint in India. Absolutely, yeah. Are there, are, are there still living saints? Of course, they're, they're always here. We're the ones who aren't here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're just slogging through daily life. These beings are present always. Yeah. Completely open, completely enlightened, and taking care of things, for sure. But we only see them when we're ready to see them, and it's in our best interest to meet them. In my experience of performing, I can say that I experienced uh, what I would call projection, where people would identify me personally as the source of their enjoyment and would think that even though they didn't know me, that I was the source of their joy. And yeah. I and I, I came to understand that they were just projecting that and reflecting their own joy towards me, which I appreciate. With the kind of work that you do that, that goes deeper into spirituality, I'm assuming that that happens sometimes. What are some ways that you manage that, if at all? Uh, it's grace, only grace, that keeps me straight about that. Yeah. When I first started to sing with people in 1994, that was a big problem for me. So I quit. I went back to India and I was, I started talking to Maharaji, you know, he'd been dead 21 years, but that didn't stop me. I said, you know, you have to change this. You have to fix this. <laughs> you don't fix this. I don't sing. It's that simple. Good night. You know? <laughs> I wake up in the morning. Hey, what's up? You haven't fixed this. Yeah. I told you, you have to fix this. I'm not singing. I'm singing to people in your name. And I can't do it, and I'm not doing it right. So it's your problem. If you don't fix it, I don't sing. That's the deal. It took three months of me torturing him and myself. And finally, uh, just before I was getting ready back to come to come back to America, he, he did. He changed it. He fixed everything, which is why I could come back and sing. It's a long story, and it's in my book, Chance of a Lifetime. There's a blurb, a, a plug. Everybody should pick that up. And we're going to put that in the show notes, too, so you can find it easily. Yeah. So I see it as grace. Yes, I yes I wanted to do this. Yes, I knew I had to do this. Uh, but I was unable to do it because of my belief system about myself and of how I felt and what I what I the way I saw was going to the projections that people were making onto me. Yeah. I was going to use all that to feed myself because I was a hungry guy. Yeah. You know, and if you're hungry, you eat. There's no option. You're hungry, you eat. And that would not be good for me, nor would it be good for the people who I was devouring right. or the energy I was using to prop my ego up. And uh, I couldn't bear that because I needed to deepen my connection with him. 21 years had gone since he had left the body. And I had pretty much uh, done everything I could to kill myself except, you know, besides actually pulling the plug. And uh, now I wanted to reconnect. I needed to reconnect to him in a deeper way. I, re I needed to get back to that place. You know, he said many times, he said, once I take hold of your hand, I never let go, even when you let go of mine. And I had let go of his hand. And now I was looking for that hand again. And I knew that chanting could bring me back to that hand, but I was incapable of doing it the right way. That's the way I said it to myself. So, like I said, I quit, and I, I said, this is it. You have to fix this, and and he did fix it. He did. I appreciate you sharing that. That is very, very moving and me and meaningful. Yeah, you know, there's a great saint, in, there was a great saint, uh, Ramana Maharshi, and he said, if you ask the ego to kill the ego, it's like asking the, the thief to be the policeman. <laughs> that, that there will be a lot of investigation yeah. <laughs> but no arrest will ever be made. <laughs> yeah, and that's I, the truth. Yeah, so I really, I, I, I prayed for grace. I prayed for it because I couldn't do it, and I knew I couldn't do it. There was no doubt. 
And so if it was going to happen, it had to be, he, he had to take care of it, and he did. It's such a hard position to be in where, at least my own experience of it is, being in front of people every night and having the experience be that there's applause and there are accolades and there is uh, attention and smiles and all the things that go with that. And also no one's saying no. No one's saying, hey, Jim, you're being an asshole. Stop that. Because everyone that's surrounding me worked for me, so they depended on me for the job. <laughs> it is uh, unnatural. But it's I your work, not their work. That's the difference. Let them do what they do. Your work is to, is to stay sane or try to at least pretend you're sane once in a while. Yes, you know, all kinds and, of pretending. Yeah, but some pretending, you know, is good because you, you see what it might be like to be sane. And it's okay to enjoy all that stuff. But once you really start to take it personally, then it pulls you down. Then you start trying to fulfill other people's desires and, uh, and, right. and be who other people want you to be. Then you get lost. And that's what had, was going to happen to me. And I didn't, I was trying to get found. You know, so there's no reason not to enjoy. I enjoy the chanting very much. I enjoy that people enjoy. Yeah. Why not? Why not? But it's my practice, so it keeps bringing me back to to myself. Everything we keep talking about comes right back to that spot each time I'm noticing. Shri Guru Charan Saro Jaraja Nijamano Kurusudhari Barano Ragubara Bimala Jasu Jodayak Palachari Buddhihin Tanujanike Sumerom Pavan Kumar Palaburividya Dehumohi Parahu Kalesa because. Yesterday, I was thinking about you, and I turned on Spotify and found uh, one of the versions of the Hanuman Chalisa mm. that I, I hadn't heard in a long time. And I'm driving, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this. This is my, you know, it's my favorite, favorite thing that you do. Mm. Um, and at the end, there's something at the end, and I just welled up and broke down in tears, like a t mm. tears of joy. But like this, this feeling of my heart going and just opening wide open, and it's happened to me before with that one. Mm. I don't, I don't know Hindi. I don't understand the language, uh, but I, but I feel it. What is it about that particular chant? Maybe I'm the only one in the world that happens to. But I'm assuming uh, that I'm assuming that maybe not. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. what is it about this one? Well, um, the proof of the pudding is in the pie. The real meaning of these chants is our experience. So let's just say that the Hanuman Chalisa is a very powerful mantra and that Maharaji gave us that practice to do. And he's very much, you could say, he, he transmits very strongly through that practice of the Hanuman Chalisa, which is a chant to the monkey god Hanuman. That's one way of talking about it. Yeah. Uh, but who is that? We don't know. <laughs> It's like, you know, but let's just simply say that it's a, it's a very powerful way of, of plugging into a deeper place. That is a us. recurring the less, theme, uh, I find, we which think is un about unplugging it. from the my more we, analysis. we keep plugging in, the better it'll be. Yeah. You need to have an idea of where that lighthouse is, you know. Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't see the lighthouse or if you don't even know there's a lighthouse, forget it. You're just out to seas. But once you know that there's a lighthouse... You keep reorienting yourself to that in that direction with your mind, and then that gets deeper, and then you start to recognize what that feels like when you're plugged in, and then you long for that, and so then you find ways to breathe into that place within us, you know, uh, more often. Well, Katie, I could talk to you for another ten hours. I'm I'm sure that you've got plenty of things to do. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk another time. Sure, anytime. Um, yeah. Before you go, could you tell us a little bit about what you have coming up this year? I'm traveling all over. I'm going to uh, I'm going back to India for a little while. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be going to Europe again in September for a kind of a short tour. Then I come back. I'll be in New York in November. 
And then we have the ongoing retreats on Maui in uh, December and May. Mm -hmm. uh, Open Your Heart in Paradise, it's called. And these will be the first ones we do since Ram Dass has left the body. I'm sure they'll be very, very emotional and very powerful. It's all up on krishnadas.com somewhere. Usually that, that's what I do to find out where I am when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> You know, I, I was on it today. I'm, I'll definitely include that in all of our show notes so people can find Very good. that. Absolutely. Good. And uh, just to let everybody else know out there, Krishna Das has an excellent YouTube page. He's on places like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. He even has his own Sirius XM satellite radio station called Yoga Radio, Krishna Das Yoga Radio. Yeah, we present a lot of different chanting on there. Yes. Not, not just me. Not just you, but all, all kinds of yoga type music, chanting type music. Mm -hmm. um, he's on Spotify and Apple Music and all the streaming platforms. The YouTube channel, the Christian Us channel, is really uh, the best place to go for that because there's a lot of free stuff on there that's not other places. A lot of the the podcasts and and uh, I have this thing I do with people called chai and chat. We drink some tea together and just talk and hang out and. Those are really cool. And you have a podcast as well, or is that the podcast, Chai and Chat? There is a podcast, but don't ask me exactly. I, Nina said I wouldn't know what it's called. <laughs> I saw the email, but uh, what's it called? <laughs> called something. He's looking on the website right I'm now. I'm looking at what Nina said, yeah. She says, what is she? She says, uh, it's really funny what she says. Katie might not know what his podcast is called, <laughs> but it's called the Call and Response Podcast with Krishna Das. Oh, available, I like that. Available through his website. See? I may not know, but I know how to find out. That's the whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is fantastic. Uh, Katie, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to share with me and, and my audience today. Uh, please keep up the good work that you're doing. I think there's so much good that happens from it. I know uh, when I encountered you for the first time and since that time, my life has improved. And so thank you. Well, you know, your kids are growing up. It's time to get out on the road again, man. We, that, that's how we got some gigs. <laughs> you know what? I'm 100% in. Let's do that. That would be a lot of fun. Right. Very good. Okay. Much love. Take Thank you very much. Love. Take good care. Ram, Ram. Right. Well, that's it for today. I appreciate you tuning in. Remember to come see us on our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search Jim Donovan Sound Health. Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jesi Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jesi Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jesi Radhe 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 Govinda Radhe Radhe Sham Gopal 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 Radhe Radhe De Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jai Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jai Radhe Jai Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Sham Gopal Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Sham Gopal Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Sham Gopal Radhe Radhe Jai Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jai Radhe 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 Jai Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jai Radhe 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 Sham Govinda Radhe Jai Radhe Govinda 
राधे राधे श्याम गोपाल राधे राधे गोपाल राधे राधे जे राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे जय राधे 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 श्याम गोपाल राधे जय श्री राधे 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 श्याम गोपाल राधे राधे हे गोविंद राधे राधे श्याम गोपाल राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे राधे श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे जय राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे जय राधे राधे गोविंद राधे राधे श्याम गोपाल राधे 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 श्याम गोपाल राधे राधे जय राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे राधे जय राधे 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 श्याम गोविंद राधे जय श्री राधे गोपाल राधे राधे हे गोविंद राधे राधे श्याम गोपाल राधे राधे हे राधे 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 श्याम गोपाल राधे राधे
understand form. I also share beginner-friendly music and wellness exercises that you can use every day to feel your best. When you sign up, you also get discounts and first access to all of my sound health products and events. Remember, it's completely free. If you'd like it, just visit DonovanHealth.com and enter your name and email address, and I'll start sending you new issues right away. While you're on the website, you can also read full transcripts of this show and check out a ton of other valuable resources. If you have any feedback, send me an email to feedback at donovanhealth.com. All the information presented on this show is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. Lastly, come and visit me on our Sound Health Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channels. I'd love to see you there. The Sound Health Podcast is produced by OmniVista Health Learning and Donovan Health Solutions. For Sound Health, this is Jim Donovan. See you next time. Take care.